Hello, welcome to another episode of the Data Science Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Dave Cole, and today's guest is Dr. Sunil Kumar Vupala. Uh, Sunil, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for uh, the opportunity. I'm excited to be part of this. Yeah, this is great. So Sunil is uh, the Director of Data Science at Ericsson. He's based out of Bangalore. And today we're going to be talking a bit about like, Sunil's background. So Sunil started as a researcher uh, within the data science world, and, and he's gone from researcher to data science leader. Um, I'm very curious to hear about how that has shaped his leadership style, how he's brought in sort of some research, uh, his researcher sort of background and how it has influenced um, how he manages his team. Um, next, we're going to be talking about uh, MLOps, sort of best practices. Uh, Sunil's got some opinions there. And last but not least, um, a topic that we talk about quite frequently on, on this podcast, but I, I don't think we can talk about it enough, but it, which is dealing with sort of um, expectations uh, from our, our business counterparts and, and talking, you know, educating them on, 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 how, on how business problems can get converted into, into data science, you know, models and uh, being able to, to sort of deal with uh, the fact that these models are not perfect, um, that there is, you know, some degrees of inaccuracy um, and, and handling their expectations. So why don't we start off, uh, Sunil? I'd love to hear. So you started off at your your, your career at Infosys. You spent a number of years there, um, about a decade, yes. if I recall. Um, yes. And while you were while you were working there, you also were working to get your PhD. Um, and and to to add on to the the your accolades, you also have forty patents uh, to your, to your name. Um, talk to us a little bit, like what. What were you researching while at Infosys? Uh, how did you get your PhD? Just dive it into that for us. Definitely. An interesting question to start with, Dave. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So if I look back my journey in Infosys, maybe 15 years ago, right? So what we are trying to do as a researcher, core researcher, as a junior researcher to start with my journey, there we started with wireless sensor networks. To be very precise, I am the second member in the team after that, within seven to eight years, we ramped up up to 70 member team. We used to call convergence lab, right? So maybe mm -hmm. the terms is not just only the wireless sensor networks, the internet of things, IOT. It is just, uh, mm -hmm. maybe just like we are seeing AI as a very buzzword now, maybe 10, 15 years ago, IOT has the similar, uh, you know, maybe the hype cycle as well, right? So I have seen right, that complete right. life cycle right from the conception to how it was now. So if I recollect my journey, I started with the wireless sensor networks and then uh, Internet of Things. During that time, as you were asking my PhD journey as well, it is actually complementary, right? If, if the topic of research is completely tangential to what we are working, working for close to six to seven years is not easy. Always, actually, the PhD journey is a sinusoidal curve. Sometimes we feel as if we are solving the greatest problems in the world, but at the same time, we need to balance personal life, professional life, and my professor's expectations, right? right? So it's a balance at the end, and we need a lot of support from family and professor and the organization as well. In my case, what worked out as a win-win situation for me is we are working on the similar problem, but not exactly the same. If it is exactly the same, there will be IP issues, as you see um, now, right? right? Who claims the IP and all that. So it is a complementary thing. What does that mean is we are solving the problems using the Internet of Things. In the PhD level, I am talking about smart energy management, how it will be applied mm -hmm. for a million variable problem, theoretically. But at the same time, how do that learning, the modeling aspects of optimization, will help a campus like Infosys. We used to have a beautiful campus, like 50 acre campus uh, with uh, 50 different buildings. It's kind of a mini city. And we are able to apply mm -hmm. that learning. And one particular chapter in my thesis is actually a real implementation of the what I proposed as part of the thesis in the campus. And I have the support from my management as well. So that's where I'm talking about a win-win situation, even though it's a journey of seven to eight years to get my PhD, because we have support and that too, the institute is just across my campus, uh, maybe my office. So I can walk in any time, professor can walk in any time to the campus. If it is wow. some other, maybe in the same city, but different directions, maybe you, you, you understand the pain, even to take talk to the professor, right, right. Uh, it's not easy. But to complement to that, my professor used to be available till midnight. After my work hours, I used to have interesting discussions with professor during the midnight. 
and maybe I stayed more than 100 nights in the campus, right? So that's how it finally worked out in a complimentary way. Uh, at the end, we are able to publish the good work and then uh, granted six uh, US patents as well for that particular work. And after that, as we are talking about 40 different patents, not everything from Infosys, but maybe from my journey to Infosys, to Philips and now Ericsson, over the years, we are able to get more than 40 patents on my name. But the starting point or maybe the initial seed uh, actually started with Internet of Things, then Smart Energy Management and slowly moved in the automation and AI journey in Infosys itself, where I am actually uh, working on the platform building, right? I actually built uh, or maybe I'm a key architect at that time uh, for uh, Infosys automation platform we used to call Infosys Mana which was launched uh, for different customers that given us good experience slowly transitioning from a core researcher to understand the business value after that we continue to work on the cutting edge technologies but at the same time what portion of that really solves the business problems. It's a balance at the end, right? So otherwise we will remind ourselves as a, a good researcher. I have good respect for the researchers, what they are doing, but at the same time, unless we convert that into a real business problem solving, what value we are adding at, at the end, it, everything will be measured in the dollars, even the patents, <laughs> how much of monetization we can get at the end, right? Yeah, so that, I think that's 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 so. First of all, it's it's sort of fascinating that Infosys has created this campus and and has I imagine the, the the university that where you got your PhD was just just across the way. Yeah, uh, that that's my guess is that's that's by design and not by by accident. Is that right? Yeah, it's by design because I I can choose to do the PhD yeah. anywhere in the world. Actually, I have to be frank. I have done my master's uh, uh, dissertation from Australia. I have invitation from Australia. My own professor there to do PhD there while working in India. That is taking a lot of time and effort and all. Mm -hmm. So finally I decided to choose a campus which is very near so that actually my professor is coming from MIT. So he spent 20 years in US. So I may not be able to do directly in US, but the rich experience what he is able to right. get from there, he is able to impart that expectations uh, uh, to our PhD level as well. So I'm grateful for that. Well, that makes a lot of yeah. That uh, that that is that is very smart because um, as a researcher, a lot of folks are, are sometimes sometimes are having to sacrifice in their mind, like uh, getting a higher degree. But if you can if you're able to do both sort of at the same time and have have your your company sort of support that, obviously that's a that's a it's a win win uh, from from both perspective. What I'm interested in though is. Um, so it sounded like you were diving into IoT and then in the smart energy energy problem. Um, how, what sort of direction were you get? I mean, emphasis in, in, in my mind at least is it, you know this is a large consulting firm, um, international consulting firm. How were they guiding? Uh, you know, you mentioned dollars and cents. How are they guiding your uh, the type of research that you were doing to ensure that at the end of the day, it was going to actually result in something that could be a applicable to the business world and be beneficial to them. Interesting question. Even though the core business of it is into the services or maybe the consulting kind of a thing, we used to have a, a lab kind of an environment, you know, just with uh, four or 500 people. It's not like too many people. But at the same time, the benefit of that is we were able to work till the founders, all right? So uh, till the CXO level. The benefit of that is understanding the business um, you know, from them on what the needs at a higher management level and how we were able to bridge that. That is one. And second thing is meeting the CXOs of our customers, not just only our own founders, but whoever visits actually being the headquarters. Um, the advantage is every week some uh, CXO from um, Fortune 500 companies visit. And within that visit, Mm -hmm. They will meet the business people, their own um, uh, strategic partners, counterpart partners. But at least we will get a half an hour slot to show innovation because the company believes that innovation is right. the driving factor, right? So within that, I might have met more than 100 CXOs in my journey there and able to understand an interesting point there. In the IoT to the automation and AI, the transition is very smooth for me, as you were asking previously, right? The reason is... Yes, we are able to uh, build the platforms and able to generate thought leadership in terms of publishing papers, patents and uh, adding value to the organization. But the question from CXO is, where is the return on investment for me? 
yes sunil i will i will invest in this solution i i i uh, uh, i buy in your point saying that yes it's a smart energy management i am able to save this much of energy if you get it into the sensors in this iot system but the next question 10 years ago is when i can get the return on investment if i in, um, invest 1 million dollars can i right. get within 18 months within 24 months that question actually strike me it's not just only collection of the data internet of things is mostly sensing and actuation but to do the actuation part of it we need to do a lot of analysis that's where the ai is complementing the work and we shifted the focus a little bit yes we have done a good work in the iot to collect the data sensing part of it not just only the uh, energy management we have done actually uh, health monitoring point of it or a campus monitoring there are a lot of iot applications then we fo- started focusing on machine learning statistics uh, or anomaly detection time series depending on the real problem uh, statement point of it and how that analysis will help for a better decision making for the cxo so that that 18 months return on investment may not be very ha- hard but we are able to convince them it's not just only getting the return on investment within let's say one and a half to two years but you will get a strategic advantage if you go there so we are able to convince them by see, showing them uh, the value and we are able to partner with them because always as a leader as well data science leader is not the fun of only building from scratch if something is available off the market uh, be mm-hmm. smart to hook on it and then that yeah. will save a lot of time and effort as well right so like that it, it has a good experience of as a researcher and maybe partnering or maybe working through the data of more than 60 70 use cases across healthcare um, uh, banking uh, then uh, manufacturing different verticals right yeah you know i think there's a there's a fallacy that i think the assumption that uh, a lot of folks make about sort of uh, companies like like an infosys like services companies that they're they're, they're merely there to sort of augment like your own mm-hmm. inno- innovation or your own ideas um but a lot of them uh you know have gotten to the point where they're creating their own innovation labs similar to what yes. what you experienced and the solutions that come out of those labs are something that you know can get you started you know 60% of the way there you know uh and, and is applicable to your own can be applicable to your own world um so i think you know create in creating that that then fostering that that sort of innovation is is i think really important also to attract talent right and to keep exactly. people like yourself um who you know want to you go on and get your phd but how how has this how has has that how did that experience or shape how you're a data science leader today like how how is your maybe your your team organized i'm yeah. very curious to see um Definitely. see that from your perspective so the role i am playing as a data science leader in ericsson it's not a pure research we do have ericsson research separately and i am working as a director in mm-hmm. global ai accelerator as the name indicates it's a global team and we want to influence the application of ai and how do you accelerate the penetration of ai across the organization and to the customers so i do have my team members uh, if i see uh, uh, i uh, i have people from 15 to 30 people depending on the uh, last three years it's not consistent though but even if i take a average of 20 people with my with me yeah. they at least four or five people are phd it's actually a mix of data scientists data engineers and mles machine learning engineers which is coming upcoming uh, uh, thread or a new title uh, for the full stack uh, kind of a data scientist then the fourth one is we do mm-hmm. have we call it as a technical product managers what do that mean is always the domain experience needs to be tied in i can't get if i if i demand i need 20 data scientists or data engineers who has rich experience in telecom or for that matter any domain i worked previously in healthcare as we speak in 2022 we can't get a complete package of data scientists who has domain experience plus uh, well versed into the concepts and yeah. programming kind of thing somewhere we may need to compromise down the line maybe 5 years down the line if you see you can get uh, enough number of people from your domain as well uh, to fill in but right now due to the skill set um, uh, demand we may need to augment from different directions we do have people who have rich experience from the mind and who has curiosity to learn ai is one set of people whereas other people from different uh, uh, organizations they are coming in uh, some of them are um, with a good research background but all of them the common thing is they are good uh, data scientists or data engineers who has good programming language and concepts so this is how we are able to build the team and overall we have more than 300 data scientists and engineers across the globe right but 
if you ask me the next question in terms of uh, how my experience so far as a researcher helped me in uh, shaping up my uh, team or maybe the exciting uh, them for their work, I could see two reasons. Um, uh, as a data science leader, what practices uh, I am following it up for their better career opportunities. It's not just at the end uh, getting the team members together. We need to excite them with the work at the same time, giving them the challenging work and motivating them for their uh, career aspirations point of it, right? So keeping those in, in, in picture, the approach what we are following, especially in terms of understanding the map depth while we are really solving the problem and then converting the business problem to the data science problem, we are able to give them a helping hand in the beginning and then the senior members in the team are able to take out some of the load uh, from us so that that bandwidth for, uh, for me is going to help me to take up new tasks as well, right? So it's always the team, what we are building, if we can't micromanage each and every person, let's say 20 people who are working with me, but at the same time, there are different layers, seniors, it's a flat organization that way. Every, everybody may be reporting to me. I do have interns uh, beyond these 20 people, but having an environment on an organization point of it, knowing the core skill set point of it, they, we are creating a safety net for the uh, these people, the data scientists, so that whenever there is a help needed, we are there. But at the same time, based on the priority point of it, some of the projects, let's say at any time, if I'm uh, handling, let's say 10 deliveries kind of a thing, doesn't mean that all of them are equally uh, important. We are able to prioritize depending on the other people um, who are the with the magic skill set and all, prioritization in terms of business impact, we're able to prioritize, that is one part. Second thing is some, you may need to go deep dive into the math level, the research background is really able to help them with that. And the thought leadership is also important because if we don't want to mm -hmm. do only the projects, okay, this year we have done 50 projects, next year the target is increased by another 10%, it's not going that way. How much of reusable components we are able to create on the way so, so that the same problem what we are solving mm -hmm. 2022, we don't want to solve the same problems maybe two years down the line. We want to empower those uh, you know, solutions by building some frameworks and platforms and reusable components, common assets is the term we use internally. Can we give it to that, to the business so that they can solve those problems and the complex problems we will take it up, right? So in all these three, four aspects, the research experience is really helping in being a role model for my team at the same time, creating the safety net for them. Yes, if they need a deep dive, we, uh, we have um, uh, that kind of a flexibility. At the same time, if they are ready to uh, take their decisions and always this is a data science is a trade-off, right? When we are building the model, it's always, if I have one more month, maybe I can build a, another better model. But does it mean that it can work for any, uh, for its lifetime? No. So within the constraints of the time and the data challenges, a lot of privacy challenges, sometimes we uh, demand the business people, we need at least one, two months of data to start with. But if I wait for that, I already lose the precious time of that, right? So I need to start somewhere and then motivate the people uh, saying that, yes, you need to start even with the small set of data. Let the data keep coming, but what else we can do within, uh, within that? right, to prepare ourselves. So these kind of real life challenges we are able to face. Uh, and the industry is also don't have direct answers for all the things what I'm talking about. We are just learning as the industry is also moving towards uh, the experience which I have maybe last 10 years in, in this particular field and maybe 15 years uh, into the research is really helping me to address this problem in a more systematic way which is aligned to the data science life cycle i'm not able to hook as a, a typical software engineer where the difference is there so those are the points which i see uh, in my journey so so i'm hearing i'm hearing senior i'm hearing you say that um like your background as a researcher and the and you have some members of your team who also have similar backgrounds um has you thinking a little bit more long-term and systematic right in the sense that you don't want to be you know creating the same models today that you're um, you, know, you don't the models that you're building today. You won't be creating two years down yeah. the line as well. So, what do you what have you done? Is there tooling? Is there roles? Is there a process? Yeah. Um, what have you done to to sort of ensure that that doesn't happen? Interesting question. So what my observation in the industry as well, not just only in the Ericsson, because I worked in both service companies and product organizations. I built at least four different platforms, worked on 100 different use cases of AI, maybe 10 to 20% of them in deployment, because initially the, or uh, maybe five years down the line, or maybe 
uh, five, uh, five years ago or maybe 10 years ago, the aim is to prove that something is really working. It's not like the end goal is only the deployment, right? But if you see now, uh, uh, to answer uh, your, your point, specifically, the world is moving towards platforms and solutions, whether it's a product organization or platform organization. So you, you can see Google and Microsoft of the world also producing some kind of a plat platforms or frameworks. These are the buzzwords people are using now, especially in the AI and data science. Similarly, TCS, Infosys, all the service or IBM, uh, Watson, there are different uh, platforms and uh, so frameworks which are available. So what we are doing in our journey is we are not talking about something, a monolithic uh, big platform we will build for uh, uh, two, three years down the line. By the time maybe we are already transitioning from 4G to 5G, maybe by the time 5G to 6G. <laughs> so we we are into the bottom up approach uh, in terms of let, let's solve interesting uh, business problems and take out, uh, extract out the commonalities. And there are some platform teams who are helping on building development platform and deployment platform. To complement that, whether it is in terms of transfer learning of the models or some kind of a data quality checks for our data because we are talking about huge amount of data. Can we take some kind of a KPI calculations, or KPI scale performance indicators, whether it is a classification model or some kind of a NLP, natural language processing mo modules or computer vision. We do have projects across the spectrum. So can we take out some commonalities out of that and then build the reusable components or frameworks so that next time whether our team is working on it or our partners, business partners are working on it, they need not start from scratch, right? So that's the philosophy we are working on and we are able to build a lot of these things by this time. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let's move on and let's talk a little bit about MLOps. So, um, now that your team has, has built these models and, and used reusable components that you've built internally, um, yes. now you're ready to, 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 to put these models into production. What is like, what, what sort of best practices do you have? What is kind of your philosophy when it comes to, to putting a model in, in production and, and then monitoring it after it's been in production? That's the actually need of the hour. So I still recollect in 2019, just before this COVID scenario, one of the keynote address I was talking about, are we ready for the AI DevOps? That, mm -hmm. that was the title. So maybe that time, whether it's AI Ops or maybe ML Ops, there, there was no standard definition, but slowly in 2020, 2021, people started using ML Ops as a standard. So now everybody understands, right? So yeah. in last two, three years, the major development point of it is, one is the people are understanding the drift right so the concept drift model drift I'll, I'll go a little more deep deep dive into that but at an at a explanation point of it we have a real challenge in i think just before the covid uh, spread across the world we worked on a project where we are able to do, build the models uh, and we are able to get the accepted accuracies i'm not going to the numbers though when we are ready to deploy it because the patterns are completely changed because of the COVID, because the people are not go traveling in the same location, in the same direction, or maybe the office environment right. have changed, people have started working from home. So you can understand the 4G network. I'm not talking at 5G implementation that time. So the 4G network, what we have, it is not actually giving the desired results during the test phase, or maybe when we are uh, deploying it uh, for the first time. Where, whereas the same data what we had from the same location, one of the busiest locations in India, it is working fine uh, as per the numbers, right? So what is really happening there is the data distribution changed, the real scenario changed, which was never uh, uh, available in the historical data. So we need to be ready for that in the real situation. That's a classic example of ML apps where the retraining point of it, we should be ready. But when to do it, retraining, how often we need to do it. So the buzzwords we use it is something like model drift, right? Concept drift. If you, if you closely observe, the model drift means the relation between target variable and independent variables are changing over time. But whereas concept drift means the statistical properties of target variable itself change. Right, the, what we are trying to predict. Whereas data drift means the distribution of data used to do this prediction is changing. So all are slightly different. So we need to understand, okay, whether the data distribution is changing, maybe the data distribution is there, but the mapping to the variable is saying, uh, changing. Once you understand the uh, nitty gritties of it, then we can suggest there are a uh, lot of 
variations especially sudden drift gradual drift seasonal drift these are the ones based on the type of data right so we suggest actually once you identify the type of drift whether online learning is a better uh, approach for it or some kind of a feature dropping because the changes are happening in the data can the feature dropping or model weighting these kind of proposals we we suggest so that the business people also keep that expectations right it's not like if i get another one month i may not be able to build a better model than this maybe i can improve some accuracy but at the same time i can't guarantee that it will work forever right or nobody uh, in the world can guarantee that but at the same time have you prepared a framework with a lot of ml ops uh, uh, point of it airflow um, i'm not advocating for a particular platform here but there are open source platforms and we do have some customized version of that as well so that we are giving to our uh, business partners and our customers so that they can detect the drift much before the actual model execution happens so that we are not wasting that effort as well if the distribution is so deviated from the original one what is the point of uh, running that particular model and getting and seeing that whether that is valid uh, result or not right so that kind of a framework we are able to uh, give it to them and some of them are still in in a uh, review mode kind of a thing because even though it is one year old uh, in, into the production but still there are a lot of learning and uh, on that uh, that thing because as of now we are not able to pinpoint what kind of method we once you are yes we identified a drift for that particular drift whether it is a sudden drift concept drift and all it's not like a scientific method okay if you have this issue go to this if it is at a scientific level it is easy to build some kind of auto ml models but there's a lot of context in that we may not be able to build that auto ml yet but the world is moving towards that so how much of auto ml we can make in this particular process when the system can automatically detect a drift do a retraining while doing that retraining can i use the only last few hours of data or few days of data or only some specific class of data there are a lot of context which we need to take slowly down the line i am sure there are going to be a lot of off the shelf our hyperscaler providers also can come up with their some kind of uh, these mechanisms so that it will be easy for the customers whether it is telecom or beyond that they can apply or they can use these kind of techniques to do the better model management right uh, mm -hmm. once the model is built it requires a lot of effort and all it doesn't require a data scientist but maybe some kind of auto ml kind of a thing if it is really deviating where we need to change uh, the feature engineering point of it definitely there is a data scientist required but for some of the things uh, it can be automatically into that particular cycle of the data science and an auto retraining um, online retraining kind of a things can help in that process yeah there's a, a, a lot to unpack there um it sounds like you've you've been dealing with this this challenge for a while but i mean one thing that you said that is kind of interesting is that you uh you are sort of empowering the 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 users of the model like the the business uh, the business side to actually um be a a partner in when they see the drift and being able to sort of uh I, maybe maybe they themselves determine that the model needs to simply to be retrained um, or maybe the drift is is so bad that uh, you, you might you know maybe there's an additional data element that they know of that that would be they believe is important in order to sort of improve the the accuracy of the model uh, and in that case they would go back to you and your team and say like hey I think you might want to add this new data element in and and, and or you know you know sort of build the model from from scratch almost um, so I think that's very interesting because I think most most data science teams that I talk to, you know, they they kind of take that that ownership of the monitoring of the models um, and the determination as to whether or not to, to retrain uh, on their own. But I think you empowering your business users who have the the the, the context, right? They know, you know, when when there's a, a a new release or a new product that's gone out that has maybe a, a new data element that they're, that they're collecting. So, um, I. I, mean, I think that's very, you know, very interesting and very novel. Yeah. Um, did you have any challenges in sort of, you know, working with your, your business counterparts, uh, you know, to educate them and um, in, in this area? Definitely, definitely. If, if uh, at any time, if, if my team is developing some model, maybe, yeah, the ownership lies with us. We are not escaping from that. But at the same time, 
Right. How do you really scale it up? Because I may have 20 people or maybe our team has maybe 300 people. We are not sure if we are growing, let's say 300 to 3000, maybe down the line. Instead, we are trying to get maybe 10% of the work, workforce to use AI or data science by next three to four years. So if that is the case, that means just like IT is becoming very democratized across the organizations, we are seeing the AI democratization. There may not be seasoned data mm -hmm. scientists who may be expert or a researcher kind of a thing. But if he is able to um, maybe uh, use some kind of uh, model somebody is giving, maybe at least understanding the value of it and able to report if some issues are coming. It's a kind of a junior data scientist is also good enough uh, to maintain those models. That will be the more scalable approach what we have seen. At the same time, when you are talking about the challenges, there will be always initial hiccups, right? So maybe uh, for small, small issues also, they keep uh, pinging us what happens to this. And even though good documentation, good coding standard, those, those should be the default one. If we are not doing that, it will backfire on us. So you haven't given the trans, uh, good uh, knowledge transfer, so it will be difficult to maintain. That will go into escalation mode. But after talking about all the good standard practices of, yes, the coding standards are followed, or maybe there is enough documentation, there or video recordings how do you fix it but at the same time we need to be available for them when there is a need for it but initially uh, there will be a lot of push in terms of uh, yes there are small issues and then okay you need to do it or it may be a, the model is not working easy to say that right okay the model is not working so the model is not giving the desired results so these are the common uh, hiccups which we need to face but slowly when we are understanding okay just understand the root cause, what the issue is, whether it is some kind of a retraining or sometimes the data is not coming in the expected format. It is failing at that level. So for them, they won't understand whether it is right. failing at a data level or um, uh, at a model level or um, uh, maybe once everything is done, maybe the visualization point of it where there is an issue, right? We need to give it mm -hmm. a different level and initial uh, uh, KT is very important for uh, uh, them to really own it up and maintain that. So those are the initial challenges we have seen. And the second part is it is not easy from a business point of it to convince them, yes, you worked for six months on the model. We provided everything with you. But now you are still saying uh, we can't build a robust model which can work in all the scenarios. Business expectations wise is clear, right? Okay, I'm giving you six months of time. I will give you one more month. Okay, but still, can you give me a model right, which right. can work in all scenarios? but the world is still not prepared for it, mm -hmm. right? Slowly they are uh, coming to understand the reality of it uh, while we are progressing. So that requires some kind of uh, organizational push as well. So um, even we do have in Ericsson, there's a lot of push. Uh, we do uh, take some kind of a trainings and there are a lot of uh, uh, MOOCs also available for the people to do. get the basics. We don't require to go, everybody need to code, everybody need not uh, go into the math depth, but as a business leaders, awareness of it, speaking the data science language is very important while committing to their customers as well. Otherwise, they, there are situations for us, they over committed and it became a big headache for us to meet their timelines, deadlines point of it, right? So those challenges are always there in the business. Yeah, so so we segue nicely into our last topic here. Um, so maybe one question to sort of cap this, mm -hmm. this all off. Um, what like what advice would you give other data science leaders in terms of like, what do you think it is important for your business car counterparts to understand about sort of the data science life cycle and about, you know, building models that, that has sort of helped you manage expectations? Like what, you know, what, what specifically do you, you know, is that training involved uh, to get sort of a business business user, user up to speed? Yeah. So what, we need to have in terms of the AI is always a virtuous cycle we call it as right so if you have the good data you can build a good product but that to get the good data we need to have good mm -hmm. users that's called virtuous AI uh, uh, cycle people call it as similarly in the organization environment as well once the business is trying to understand yes the AI can solve this problem because to get to that level as well, converting the business problem to data science problem as well, they need to understand the very basics of what AI can do or what data science can do, what it cannot do. It's not like a hammer for each name, right? So that's where the hype cycle uh, 
talks no. about or maybe some our competitor has done it or maybe somebody else has done it can it be a good use case for me so they need to be realistic what are the pain points for their business right for their organization level or their unit level then they come to a, a level whether ai or a data science point of it is a good fit for that kind of a problems right so that requires a business mindset along with understanding the data science fundamentals there are a lot of courses um, which are available a lot of trainings available internally and externally as well that's the first thing we are recommending a data science leader to be part of so that the business partners or business other business leaders are speaking in the same language what the uh, what our data science leaders are talking that's the first part second thing in terms of the team right the whether the data science leadership is within the business unit or is it at a vertical level or at a horizontal that gives different challenges in terms of ownership in terms of how you speak to the uh, where the responsibility stops so if it is a vertical level maybe you are uh, responsible right from the conceptualization till the development and even to the deployment right whether if it is a horizontal maybe you are uh, talking about a development point of it and maybe deployment uh, you are taking a maybe initial deployment but uh, giving the baton to the other business uh, partners as well so that's the second way to look at and third one is attracting the right talent and then retaining and we don't require a stellar researcher for each and every problem it should be a good mix to understand the real business problems who understands the domain at the same time a, a good mix of those people really helpful for the organization or the unit especially the data science leadership point of it yeah, because at the end it's a trade off of what value we are bringing to the business by spending on the infrastructure on the people right at the end what matters is initially you may get a lot of support from the organization but down the line whether it is two years down the line three years down the line where is the dollar value we are responsible for that right so that's why leveraging the real business problems showing the impact of it and excite the team about the tech, uh, whatever the deployment happened after six months okay this is the business impact we are able to create that feedback loop is also important so that we are picking up the right business problems not just uh, by our intuition but the real data speaks for it and at the same time building the fair models robust model trusted model is the responsibility of the data science leader those are the challenges right now maybe technically we have a lot of algorithms available and all but still when it comes to the data maybe i may not be able to get that access to the data it may take a couple of months to really get it passing through all these privacy rules of the different or different countries different organizations we need to deal those um, uh, challenges effectively mm -hmm. and come up with the better approaches right they may have a private cloud environment or some federated learning approaches so necessity is mother of um, uh, invention uh, people call right so we need to see uh, the standard methods mm -hmm. may not work we need to come up with the different distributed kind of uh, ml we never talked about few years ago now we are talking about federated learning distributed learning or real time edge inference point of it always need not be cloud what will be the mm -hmm. good combination of cloud and edge so these are the things which are uh, uh, the challenges in front of the data yeah. science leaders great well sunil um, I learned a lot today. Uh, I think your, your background is fascinating um, and how you went from sort of a researcher to a data science leader and um, you're working with your, your business counterparts today to get those models into, into, into production. Uh, it sounds like you, there's a mix of, of educating them as well as actually you know making sure that your team is delivering high value models. Um, thanks so much for joining the DSL podcast. If people want to reach out to you, that can they hit you up on, on LinkedIn? Definitely. I'm very active in LinkedIn uh, with a due respect to the IP of organization. I believe in the AI democratization. That's where my weekends I keep enjoying uh, delivering lectures or participating in these kind of podcasts. That That is the way awesome. uh, to educate and sharing our knowledge that gives a lot of fun, right? Uh, thanks for the opportunity.